same uh, leads, to the, uh, leads us to consider the physical concurrence of God after we have examined the moral concurrence, which was the more perplexing. I've already urged that, uh, Bob's comment that the claim that moral concurrence is perplexing involves some hyperbole doesn't seem to take into account um, all aspects of Leibniz's view of this kind of concurrence. But Bob further contends that, this quote from Bob, the problem of uh, divine physical concurrence in sin gave Leibniz the most grief and was attended by a variety of challenges, uh, changes in attitude on his part concerning how best to handle it, end quote. It'll soon become clear that I agree with Bob that there were various changes in Leibniz's attitude toward physical concurrence and that problems concerning this kind of concurrence gave him grief. Um, but I also think that the claim that this problem gave Leibniz the most grief can be questioned on the same grounds as Leibniz's claim that the problem of moral concurrence was more perplexing. Namely, both overlook the extent to which the problems with the two kinds of concurrence are interconnected. In order to justify the distinction between willing and merely permitting that is central to his account of God's moral concurrence with moral evil, Leibniz must reconcile this distinction with his account of God's physical concurrence with moral evil. And in order for this latter account to be acceptable, Leibniz must uh, show how it at least allows for this difficult distinction. So uh, section three, physical concurrence with moral evil. In the theodicy, Leibniz's uh, official solution to the problem of God's physical concurrence with moral evil is as follows. Uh, it's from passage uh, M. Though God concurs with created agents in producing sinful action, he produces only the absolute reality or perfection of the action, whereas the agents are responsible for the privations or limitations that constitute the sinfulness of the action. This privation theory is something that uh, Leibniz had criticized in his earlier Theodosian writings. For instance, in his The Author of Sin, which dates from around 1673, Leibniz writes that in passage N, to say that God is not the author of sin because he is not the author of privation, although he can be called the author of everything that is real and positive in the sin, this is a manifest illusion. It is a leftover from the visionary philosophy of the past. It is a subterfuge with which a reasonable person will not be satisfied. We know that during the 1670s, Leibniz was influenced by the writings of Thomas Hobbes, it's a good bet that his objection to the visionary philosophy of the past also bears the imprint of Hobbes' critique of scholastic privation theory. For in the Latin edition of the Leviathan, this is 1668, Hobbes ridicules the scholastics for attempting to argue that, sin is a, that since sin is a mere anomia, or a mere negation and not a deed or any sort of action, God is not its author. Hobbes' judgment that this view shows that where the scholastics wanted to seem more subtle, they showed their st stupidity, as he puts it, anticipates, uh, well, Hobbes doesn't pull his punches, anticipates Leibniz's uh, more mildly expressed judgment that such a view is a subterfuge with which a reasonable person will not be satisfied. However, Leibniz came to have a more positive view of privation theory. In uh, concerning freedom, fate, and the grace of God, this is around 1680, I think, he claims that though, uh, quote, it seems illusory to say that God concurs in the matter of the sin, but not in, in the formal aspect, which is privation or anomia, nonetheless, one should know that this response is more solid than it appears at first glance, for every privation consists in imperfection and imperfection in limitation, end quote. In the theodicy, Leibniz attempts to defend privation theory through the use of the example of the heavily laden boat that is carried down the river by, means, by its current. Um, in this example, the current serves as the cause of the speed of the boat. However, what also requires explanation is the retardation of the speed, which is a limitation or privation. This privation derives not from the current, but rather from the restriction and the receptivity of the speed that the cargo imposes on the boat. So there seems to be a kind of division of labor here, with the current being responsible for what's positive in the speed, and the cargo in the boat being responsible for the limitation of that positive aspect. As applied to the case of sinful action, 
The result here is that, as Leibniz puts it, God is the cause of perfection in the nature and the actions of the creature, but the, limitations, uh, the limitation of the receptivity of the creatures is the cause of the defects that are in the action." End quote. This example is perhaps naturally understood to indicate that God alone is the cause of uh, the per perfections of the sinful action and that the creatures alone are the causes of the limitations of such action. However, on such an understanding, the example is problematic even in Leibniz's own terms. As other commentators have noted, uh, his opposition to occasionalism is in considerable tension with this understanding of the example. For Leibniz is strongly critical of the implication in Malbranche that creatures are not active causes of natural change. To be sure, uh, Leibniz does allow, in line with sc standard scholastic theory, that God alone is causally responsible for the initial creation and subsequent conservation of substances with their essential properties. But he insists against Malbranche, but still in accord with the scholastic consensus, uh, that creatures actively concur with God in producing their actions. Thus, Leibniz says in passage O, that even though a creature does not contribute to its own conservation, I see nothing to prevent the creature's concurrence with God for the production of any other thing, and especially might this concern its inward operation, as in the case of a thought or a volition, things really distinct from the substance." End quote. In the case of physical concurrence, then, creatures do not merely limit God's activity, as the boat merely limits the force of the current. Rather, they also act with God to produce their own modifications. I believe that Leibniz's mature metaphysics yields the following account of God's physical concurrence. In the background, we have God acting alone to create and conserve the substance with its primitive entelechy, or primitive active force. This divine action is prior in nature to the production of the qualities or derivative forces, which themselves are modifications of this primitive active force. In the case of sinful action, the most important modifications of this force are the volitions that are the internal causes of the perceptual changes involved in such action. In acting with the created substance to produce these modifications, God not only produces the primitive active force, but also produces it as producing its own volitions. In positively contributing uh, to the production of their volitions, it seems that creatures act with God as efficient causes. Indeed, I think Leibniz indicated as much as in the theodicy when responding to Bale's claim that philosophical considerations can never establish, uh, according to Bale, that we are the efficient cause of our own volitions. Leibniz's response is that it follows from his theory of pre-established harmony that, quote, each substance is the sole cause of all its actions, and it is free of all physical influence from every other substance, save the customary concurrence of God, end quote. His theory presumably provides philosophical reasons to hold, contrary to Bale, that rational agents are efficient causes that act with God to produce their volitions. What are we to make, then, of Leibniz's suggestion of a kind of division of labor in the production of sinful action, in which God produces perfections and creatures produce privations? Well, let's start with the following expression in the theodicy of this sort of view in passage P. Leibniz notes that though God is the one principal cause of pure and absolute realities or perfections, we must say that second causes concur in the production of that which is limited. Otherwise, God would be the cause of sin, even the sole cause. Once again, this can be read as saying that God alone is the cause of the absolute realities and that second causes contribute only the limitations or privations. So read, this view is obviously in tension with Leibniz's rejection of occasionalism. However, it's significant that Leibniz speaks in this passage of God as the principal cause, since in that same passage he also endorses the maxim, causae secundae agunt in virtute primae, second causes act in virtue of the primary. The indication here is that second causes act through the efficient causal activity of the principal cause. In light of this indication, we can take Leibniz's view to be that rational agents act in virtue of God's activity insofar as they concur with God in efficiently causing the volitions that modify their primitive active force. Moreover, in saying that second causes concur in the production of what's limited, 
His point is not that such causes contribute only the limitations, but rather that the limitations or privations they contribute are entirely from them and thus not from God. It's crucial here that privations in creatures make a distinctive sort of causal contribution to sinful action. In some of his earlier writings, Leibniz was skeptical that privations can make any sort of such contribution given that they are mere absences. Thus, he pr protests in an early work that privation is a non-being, a negative thing, in which no concurrence or influx, as they call it, takes place. The position here is reflected in the argument in the recent literature that there can be no causation by absence, given that absences cannot serve as relata in causal relations. But in the theodicy, Leibniz insists that even though privative beings are merely a kind of absence or limitation, they nonetheless can function as a kind of what he calls defective cause of the further limitations that constitute evil. Um, in support of this position, he invokes the maxim malum causum habet non efficientum sed deficientum. Uh, so evil has not an efficient, but a deficient cause. Here it's important not only that the deficient cause be a privation, but also that what uh, derives from it be a further privation. By contrast, the efficient cause must be something that not only is actual, but also produces something else that's actual. It's admittedly difficult to understand the notion of deficient causes in terms of the boat example I mentioned earlier, since the weight of the cargo does seem to be, doesn't seem to be a mere privation. But Leibniz offers in addition what is perhaps a more appropriate example of deficient causation, and this is um, the destruction of the gun barrel that's brought about by the freezing of water in it. Cold itself is merely a certain privation of force due, a, due to a diminution of motion, but this privation allows for the increased action of the compressed air in the sides of the barrel. In this case, cold serves as a kind of deficient cause that corrupts, as it were, the action of the compressed air so that it yields the destruction of the barrel. The deficient cause is what explains the fact that the activity of some positive force results in further limitations or privations. In the case of sinful action, there's also a positive force or action that is deficient due to the fact that it derives from the deficient causation of a privation. According to Leibniz, the will itself is positive insofar as tending toward the good in general, it must strive after all the perfections that befit us, according to Leibniz. God physically concurs with the sin of created agents insofar as he is an efficient cause of the tendency toward the good that is manifested in their sinful actions, but the lack of adequate perception of the good serves as a deficient cause of the moral evil of the actions. A privation in the striving of the will results from the privation of adequacy in the perception, just as the privation in the gun barrel results from the privation manifested in the coldness of the water. Okay, so I'll skip a little bit. It might seem, however, that even if sinful action derives from privations in the agent rather than from God's physical concurrence with the action, because God only concurs with the efficient causation, not with the deficient causation, nonetheless, the original production of the creatures with privations must be attributed to God. For in the case of creation, there would appear to be nothing other than God who could be the source of the initial privations in creature in creatures that makes evil possible. And Mike Hickson noted that this objection in bail. And I'll just, uh, going through quickly, the response is that, no, the privation, and this is a passage Don cited, the privation derives from forms in the divine intellect, not from the divine will, right? So that's set in the natures of things. God does, it doesn't derive from God's uh, productive will. So even though uh, perceptual privation and intelligent agents can be said to be the proximate deficient cause of moral evil, nonetheless, as Leibniz notes, the original imperfection in creatures, which is already present in the eternal ideas, is the first and most remote cause. In this way, then, deficient causation always derives from creatures or their essences, never from God and his will. In conclusion, I'd like to return to Leibniz's insistence that in morally concurring with sinful action, God merely permits and does not will such action. 
One way of defending the difficult distinction between willing and merely permitting is by linking it to Leibniz's account of deficient causation of creaturely privations. An initial point is that God physically concurs in sinful 